must take a proactive stand on many, many issues. Matter of fact, it's becoming evident that our church must take a stand in every cultural issue. And that is why it is even some of our youth staff members that wanted to come tonight to share in this meeting tonight. And this is an area like this that Brother Alamolan Paul has blessed the Apostolic Church for many years. It's going to bless us tonight to equip us as we step in and fulfill the mandate that God has given us to go ye into all the world. But part of that is equipping us. Amen? Amen. And so it's our honor to have Brother Molan Paul. Brother Molan Paul, come minister to us tonight. We're going to preach with you, my brother. <laughs> it is so good to be at New Life again. Now, I recognize I can do nothing, so let's pray the Lord to help. Jesus, we do thank you for your goodness. We thank you, Lord, for your blessings. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for everyone that's here that has braved the weather tonight. We pray that you would reward them, give them something that would inspire them, for we know that we can only do anything worthwhile by your help. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. All right, now... Tonight, we want to talk about a big word called teleology. I won't use that word anymore. It's the study of design and purpose in nature. This thought, as far as I know, was first coined by a theologian by the name of William Paley. And what he thought and what he considered was that if you're passing through a field and you see rocks, you see, you know, hundreds of rocks and so forth. But if you come across something that's different and you come across a watch, there is a extreme difference. You can recognize the difference between a rock and a watch. You could recognize the planning and the craftsmanship involved. You could recognize the beauty and the usefulness. Now, when I look at my watch, I see a little hand going around. Was that by accident? I have another little thing that says W-E-D. Now, that's not WED. That's Wednesday. And it says 23. And you know what it'll do tomorrow? It'll say T-H-U, 24. Did that evolve? Was that by time and chance like the shape of the rock? Or do you think that behind this watch there was a watchmaker? Now, he argued then, William Paley did, that if the watch required a watchmaker, certainly the things in nature, the complex things in living systems must have required a designer, and a maker. You know, I really like to call this the common sense principle. It just makes sense. Another fellow used this argument. If you were passing through a creek bed and you just saw hundreds and thousands of rocks and then saw one rock, which I don't know if you can see very well there in the lower right-hand corner, but can anybody tell what that is? An arrowhead. Now, do you think that came about the same as all the other rocks? No, you recognize the sharp angles and so forth that behind this arrowhead, there must have been an Indian and there must have been an arrow-making process, even though you've never seen the Indian or the arrow-making process. You just sense that. Now, I've never seen God. I've never seen his creation process. But when I look at creation, praise God, I understand there was a designer. And thank God we know who that is. I like this illustration. Let me uh, give Ingen's husband. Would you come up here? Brother Turner, would you, would you help me? Now, let's say that 
Brother Turner and I, I guess they're photographing this so we can't walk very far. But let's say that we were walking along the seashore, and I want to see that up there, and I think we both could agree what that is. What is it? Sure, it's a sandcastle. And probably we could agree on the color. Kind of a gray. Kind of a gray. Uh, I think if we had a ruler, Brother Turner, I think we probably could agree on the height of it. But neither one of us saw it made. What do you think? How do you think it got there? Well, somebody had to design it and make it. Uh-uh. Yeah. Uh-uh. The wind and the waves washed it up there. <laughs> now, we could argue till we're blue in the face. We agree on some things, but how it got there, we could argue till we're blue in the face. But let me ask you, how many of you agree with Brother Turner that there was a sculptor? Just one or two? <laughs> how many agree with me that the wind and the waves washed up there? Well, I see a couple, but I don't think you really do. Okay. You can be seated. Thanks. But I want to say, you know, I remember I had the privilege of sitting under Brother S.G. Norris, and he used to have the phrase, anybody with one eye half cents of the third grade education could understand that. You know, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to recognize that behind the sandcastle there was a sculptor. Behind the painter, painting, there's a painter. Behind the builder, there was an architect. And on and on. Now, I think this is interesting, too. Have any of you ever been to South Dakota? Okay, have any of you seen the Badlands? And, I mean, they're really bad land, aren't they, Sister Tracy? Now they're just wasteland. I don't think we have any problem that this was the product of wind and erosion over many, many years. I, I have no problem believing that. But you drive further in South Dakota, and isn't it wonderful what the wind and the erosion did? <laughs> now, we all recognize, I mean, it wasn't just by accident that that one fellow on the left happens to look like who? George Washington, the one next to it, Thomas Jefferson, I'm helping you out, the one in the center, Teddy Roosevelt, the one on the right. Abraham Lincoln, isn't it wonderful the wind and the water and so forth washed even a beard on Abraham Lincoln? No. Now, if you didn't know anything about history, whatever, you would realize that behind that Mount Rushmore Memorial, there was a sculptor. And, of course, we know his name was Gutzen Borglum, I think. I'm not a Scandinavian. And his son, Lincoln, finished it, okay, after he passed away. Now, when we look at nature, for example, the walnut, if there's any engineers in here, you recognize that a walnut has a tremendous strength-to-weight ratio. Its dome shape and its corrugated surface, was that by accident? Or did the creator of the walnut design that to preserve the meat inside, you know, the nut inside the walnut? Even the worm. You know, if I ask you what worms were good for, some of you probably say, Feed for f birds and others say for fishing. But really, I think that's all right. But, uh, you know, even the, the worm uh, is valuable for aeration and drainage of the soil that is produced. I believe God designed even the worm for a purpose. And then there's the, the woodpecker. Now, this is an... Un <laughs> wow, boy. I mean, he's really... Wow. Now, can, can, can you imagine beating yourself against this pulpit? I, I, I mean, you would get a splitting headache. You know? Why doesn't the woodpecker get a splitting headache? And if you would look at the toes on the woodpecker, you would see that two point forward. Uh, upward, two downwards, and it supports itself by the tail. But another thing it does, it's 
it's able to stick its tongue out about 10 or 12 inches. It doesn't have that long a tongue, but it has a hyoid that goes over the top and extends out that tongue, and that tongue is coated with a sticky saliva so it can get the bug or what it's after. Did that evolve? Was that by time and chance? Or did God create the woodpecker? The wombat is a little marsupial that lives in Australia. A marsupial is uh, something that the development of the young continues in a pouch. A kangaroo is probably the best known. But the, the, the wombat buries under the ground. And it can burrow, I mean, it can burrow like 100 feet under the ground. Where a kangaroo's pouch opens toward its face, a wombat's pouch opens toward its tail. And this enables it to burrow under the ground and still the, uh, you know, little wombats survive. They say an evolutionist guide in Australia said, isn't it wonderful what evolution did over a million years? It turned the pouch to turn backwards? Well, what would all those poor little wombats have done for a million years? They'd have ate dirt and died, wouldn't they? All right. Okay. And then there's the giraffe. It is interesting. As far as I know, the giraffe is the tallest animal on earth today. It has, uh, it, some of them will reach 18 feet, maybe even a little bit higher. But in order for the blood to get up the brain, which is necessary, you know, to pr pump something up that high requires a pressure. So it has the largest heart. It has the largest pressure, blood pressure, in order to pump the blood up to the top. But supposing the giraffe gets thirsty. Well, it has to bend that head down to the water. What keeps that blood from, shall we say, just pumping out and damaging its brain? Well, there is some spongy tissue that, and some valves in the, the neck, and that prevents that surge of blood from damaging the brain. Is that an accident? Was that a product of evolution and time and chance? Or do you think that God designed the giraffe? Let's move on. Geology. Another big word. It's the study of the structure of the earth. How does the earth show purpose and design? We've shown the animal kingdom and plant kingdom. Let's talk about the earth. The first thing about the earth is the rotation. If my microphone was the sun and my earth was the right hand, the thumb would be the day portion, a little finger would be in the dark portion. As that rotates, then we have day and night. We rotate, and I know you know this, every 24 hours. Supposing we rotated slower, like once every 50 hours instead of once every 24 hours, then our days would be 25 hours long. Our nights would be 24 hours long. We would burn up in the daytime. We would freeze to death at nighttime. Who designed it to rotate at the right speed? Was that by evolution? How about the tilt? The earth tilted like this, 23 and a half degrees. If the tilt is like my arm and the microphone was like my sun, the sun I mean, then the top portion of my, my arm would be in what season? It's further away from the sun. It's in the winter. But when it's summertime, I can't even do this. I'm stretching exercise. It's closer. It is the tilt that produces our seasons. Also, uh, the revolution around the sun, where we revolve around the sun once every 365 and a quarter days, that produces our year. If we were traveling faster, we would be further away, and it would be so cold that we wouldn't be able to bear it. On the other hand, if the speed of the earth was slower, we would be closer to the sun and we'd burn up. Was that accident or design? 
Well, I'm asking the same question, and you're giving the same answer, and I'm sure it's true. And the air and water is very, very important. If it wasn't for the air and the water uh, and the abundance of it, and by the way, our plant is the only planet that has the air and the water and the vegetation that's necessary for life. How did that come about? The Bible says this, God formed the earth to be inhabited. It's like a builder. If he's building a house, he'll build a kitchen, he'll build bathrooms, he'll build bedrooms, he'll build closets because he expects the house to be inhabited. And God in six days formed the earth to be inhabited. It's a prepared place for the image of God to dwell in. And I think of it when I talk about it, I'm so glad before Jesus left, he said, I go away and prepare a place for you. And when you think of what he did in six days, think of what he's built for us in eternity. Aren't you glad you have that kind of hope? Air is extremely important. Without air, there could be no life. I am told, I've never tried it, that you could go about 30 days without food. I probably ought to try it, but I, <laughs> I probably need to try it, but I haven't. And I wouldn't encourage you to do it if you never fasted before. Uh, so you go approximately a month without food. Again, I haven't tried it, but they, you know, there was a supernatural fast like Elijah and Jesus and so forth. But again, uh, you could go approximately a week without water. But how long can you go without air? Well, I don't want to prove this scientifically. I don't want you to hold your breath and find out. I don't want anybody to pass out. Honest, but probably just a few minutes. It's extremely important. And then the composition of the air is just perfect for life. Air being approximately one-fifth oxygen and four-fifth nitrogen and some traces of other gases, probably less than a percent. What if the composition was different? What if it was 25% oxygen? You know what would happen? Well, I don't know whether any of you have taken chemistry or not, but I used to teach chemistry. But if I took some, some steel wool and I heat it in a Bunsen burner and then I plunge it into oxygen, it'll burn up. And the earth would burn up if it was 25% oxygen rather than 20%. Who created the right composition for the air? And then the, the fact that air expands when it heats and then it rises and fresh air comes in below, which is the wind and so forth. So important for the surface temperature of the earth. And then the dust, which you ladies probably think is a nuisance because you have to dust regularly. If it wasn't for the dust, the rain and the snow couldn't co coalesce on it. Now let's talk about water. Plants and animals need water to live. Plants use water to produce the food that man eats. Water makes the soil by erosion and expansion, and water provides the temperature co uh, control. That's reason why a place like Norway isn't completely frozen solid is because the water around it is providing some temperature control. Now, water has some very unusual properties. I think I mentioned about eight of them in my book. I'm just going to mention a couple of them. These, uh, and these properties are a real blessing to us, unusual properties. For example, to melt a gram of water at its melting point is called a latent heat effusion. Water has a very high latent heat effusion compared to other chemicals, some 80 calories per gram. Why is that important to us? If it wasn't for that high heat of fusion, the first 
warm day, all the snow on the mountains would melt and you'd have tremendous floods and then no water in the streams and the, and the rivers the rest of the year. The oceans don't freeze over either because of it. Now, water also has a, a very interesting property and that is that it expands when it freezes. You put something like uh, wax and melt it and put it in your freezer, you'll see that when it freezes, it shrinks. But water has the property that it expands. It, it shrinks and shrinks until it gets to about 4 degrees centigrade, and then it starts expanding. And so ice is less dense than water, and it comes to the surface. Why is that important? Well, it causes the ice to float and the lakes to freeze over at the top rather than the bottom. This prevents the rest of the lake from freezing. If it wasn't for that, all the fish in Minnesota and Wisconsin would have died already by now. I'm glad God created the earth with abundance of water and all these unusual properties that make the survival of life possible. It was not by accident. It was designed. Let's talk about gravity for just a minute. We all know and observe gravity, but I've yet to hear anybody explain what causes gravity. It's extremely important to us because if it wasn't for gravity, the water would all fly off the earth. In fact, even we are traveling right now at least a thousand miles an hour. Do you realize that? You're going about a thousand miles an hour. If the earth has a circumference of 24,000 uh, miles, and we're rotating once every 24 hours, we're traveling about a thousand miles an hour. Why don't we fly off into space? It's gravity that God designed. And this is what keeps uh, the atmosphere from escaping into the, uh, the uh, space. If it wasn't for gravity, the earth would just take off into space and who knows where we would be. God created gravity. Let's talk just a little bit about astronomy in the Bible. I think it's worth mentioning this because uh, uh, people get confused between astronomy and astrology. Now, astronomy is the science of the uh, sun, the moon, the planets, the stars, and so forth, their distance, their positions, and so forth. Nothing wrong with studying astronomy. Astrology, on the other hand, is the false science that says that somehow the position of these planets and so forth have an effect on your life. That's, as I said earlier, that's hogwash. Don't look at the horoscope. Don't study astrology. God hated astrology. I understand it was formed by the Babylonians. Astronomy, okay, but not astrology. What's the purpose of the sun? Well, it provides the light during the day. Thank God for daylight. It also provides the energy for the continuance of life. It's needed to continue life. But one of the things I think is really interesting, it's the right amount of energy. Somebody who said if we got 1% less sunlight, we would freeze to death. If it got 1% more, we would burn up. We're 93 million miles away from the sun. It is interesting also that some stars fluctuate in the amount of energy they give off. They, some of them vary from as much down as low as 10% of the average energy to 150,000 times the average, you know, with burst of the, sun, of the star. But yet our sun is designed so it gives almost a uniform source of energy. Is that by accident? I don't think so. Okay. And then it's the right kind of energy. Do you know that most stars give off energy mainly in X-rays and gamma rays, which would kill a person if we got most of our light from the stars. But our sun gives off most of its energy in what's called the visible spectrum or nearby the ultraviolet or the infrared. No accident. God 
design the sun for us to live. How about the moon? The moon has purpose, gives us an adequate night illumination. The Bible says the lesser light to rule by night. Aren't you glad for night lights? I was in a motel in Tampa last week, and it was kind of a strange uh, the way it was. If I had to get up in the middle of the night, there was a big chair I'd have to stumble over. So I left the light on in the restroom and closed the door a little bit so I could have a night light. Thank God for the night light that God has created. It's very interesting that the moon looks like it's about the same size as the sun, yet it's one four hundredth the size of the sun. But it happens to be one four hundredth closer than the sun. So it appears to be the same size. The moon also is an accurate time record. It revolves around the earth once every 29 and a half days. That's where we get our term month from the moon. We're in the month of February. And it also, the gravitational effect, uh, attraction of the moon toward the earth is what causes our tides. If it wasn't for our tides, the shores would stagnate. Now, how about the stars? Do they give evidence of design and planning? Well, the Bible says this, the heavens declare the glory of God. And the firmament declareth his handiwork. God told Abraham that his seed would be like the stars of the sky. He not only knows the number of the stars, the Bible says he knows them by name. Thank God, God knows all about it. Our universe is an orderly universe called the cosmos. If evolution would be true, it would be a chaos. It would be disorderly. The Bible says this, The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of His hand. Day after day they pour forth speech. Night after night they display knowledge. There is no speech or language where their voice is not heard. Their voice and then little trouble see, goes out and to all the earth the words to the end of the world. Now, let me just say this. I believe this. Any honest person, when they look at the creation, whether it be from a walnut or a worm to a giraffe or to the earth or to the moon or the stars, they declare the glory of God. Anybody who does not accept that is willingly ignorant. But they do not declare that this great God came in the form of flesh, suffered and died on Calvary, shed his blood for our sins, was buried and rose again. That's our job to tell them. The gospel, the preaching of the gospel, God has reserved for us. The psalmist said this, When I consider the heavens, the work of thy fingers the moon and the stars which thou hast ordained. What is man that thou art mindful of him? When you consider the mighty creation and the extent of his creation, I've used an illustration before that if the universe was the size of this auditorium, the earth would be smaller than a BB. And on that little BB, there's some six and a half billion people. But you know what I believe? I believe if there had been no one else who ever sinned, Jesus Christ would have come, suffered, and died for me. Thank God. What is man that thou art mindful of? I don't know, but he is mindful of us. Now let's talk about the human body. <laughs> this picture, the Bible says this, I will praise thee for I am fearfully and wonderfully evolved. Is that what it says? Fearfully and wonderfully made. And this happens to be Sam's little girl. <laughs> my wife wanted to put that in. But not only is my granddaughter wonderfully and fearfully made, you're wonderfully and fearfully made. You know, if you ever get down in the dumps... 
just recognized how good God is to you. Let's just talk about the human body a little bit. The eye. The eye is a marvelous creation. It has a cornea. It has a pupil which uh, opens and closes to allow variation in light. It has the iris for the color. It has muscles which uh, enable the eye to turn and also to change the shape of the lens to see things close up or far away. It has eyelids and it has tears. Now, I think it's neat on my car when my windshield gets uh, dirty, I just press a little button and it sprays up and the windshield wipers go. Well, you know, God thought of that many, many years ago. When your eyes need a little cleaning, you... Tears come and your eyelids wash it. Great windshield wiper washer, isn't it? Amen. And then, and then the eyebrows, they also uh, protect, prevent uh, you know, sweat from coming to your eyes. And then I don't have it on the screen, but I think of the eye. The eye is in a socket in your skull. I dare say that if the eye had been put on your forehead or on your chin, or the back of your head, that all of us would be blind by now. Have you ever gotten hit in the eye with a ball? Well, it's in a socket. That's why you're not blind today. Who designed the eye to be in a socket? Who designed the skull to have two holes for the eye and two holes for the nose and so forth? Now, this quote... uh, has been attributed to Charles Darwin, and I'm not really sure of this, but it's still a good quote. To suppose that the eye, and I won't read all about it, but about all of its abilities, to suppose that that was formed by natural selection seems absurd in the highest degree. The ear. Now, sometimes we laugh about the shape of our ear. Sometimes we call ourselves Dumbo and so forth. But the outer ear is designed to collect the sound waves. And even the hair and the wax, which seem to be a nuisance to you, that's necessary for trapping the dust and so forth. And the wax, if you swim underwater, to keep the water from going inside into the inner ear. And then there's the eardrum, which helps us hear. And the, the three bones, the hammer, the anvil, the stirrup, and the eustachian tube, which equalizes the pressure in your ear, in the organ of Cordy, which enables us to hear and also gives us our sense and balance. How did that come about? The Bible says this, the hearing ear and the seeing eye are marvelous evolved. No, it says the hearing ear and the seeing eye, the Lord has made them both. And then there's the nose. Now, you may think that your nose is kind of funny, like this guy's nose. But the nose has been called the world's finest air conditioner. When you think of the fact that the nose is what moistens the air as it comes in, the hair and the mucus in your nose is what filters the air. The bone, the turbinate bone in your nose is what warms the air in cold weather. And the Sensation of smell is what the nose provides for us. Let's move on to the tongue. The tongue helps us chew and swallow. The tongue clears out our mouth. The tongue enables us to taste things like sweet and sour and so forth. But it also helps us to form sounds. Try, for example, right now, putting the top, the tongue of yours to the top of your mouth and then try to say D. Would you do it? D. Try saying H. H. How about J? L. N. S. T. U. W. Z. You'd have a tough time, wouldn't you? Was the tongue an accident? How many have ever burnt your, burnt your tongue? I want you to thank God right now that you burnt your tongue. Because if you hadn't burnt your tongue, you would have burnt your throat or burnt your stomach. Also, the tongue, you can even tell sometimes the health of a person by, you know, you remember as a child, stick out your tongue and see what it looks like. Okay, 
the skin. The skin enables us to feel pain. It enables us to feel texture. For example, we can feel an apple. If it's soft, we know we don't want to buy it. We can feel uh, the heat and cold with this, with the uh, skin. And it controls the temperature. You have a marvelous temperature controlling system in your body. It beats a thermostat. It was designed long before the thermostat. When you get cold, your brain signals your body to burn up some food to produce energy and warmth. On the other hand, when you get hot, your brain tells your body to perspire. The evaporation of the, the perspiration is what cools down your body. What a marvelous design. I debated a fella at uh, Florida State University last year, and uh, he said that the human body was a poor design. I don't know about him, but I'm wonderfully and fearfully made, aren't you? Praise God. Let's talk about the skeletal system. Do you realize that when you were born, you had some 360 bones, and now as adults, you have 206 bones? It was that way so you could pass through your mother's birth canal, and then they fused together. The bones produce red blood cells. Do you know that the human skeleton is extremely strong? It has been documented that this uh, fellow was working under a car. The jack collapsed and the car fell on him and his father picked up one end of a 3,600 pound car and got his son out from it. The skeleton is an extremely strong thing. The hand, the hand has been called nature's best tool. It can serve as a cup. It can serve as a hook. It can operate a hammer. It can operate tweezers. It can operate scissors. It can sense if dirt is wet, too wet, or, or so forth. It is a marvelous tool. Two bones in the forearm to enable your arm to twist. Was that by accident? No. The kneecap. If it wasn't the kneecap, I believe your, your legs would bend both ways. Aren't you glad they only bends one way? You'd be a wobbly creature, wouldn't you? Let's hurry on. The foot, the foot is, the arches especially are what are so important. They serve as shock absorber for your whole body. It allows us to run, to jump, to turn, to twist, and so forth. The other systems of the body, I'll just briefly go through the digestive system, which starts with 32 teeth. The hardest member of your body is in the mouth, the teeth. Was that by accident? No, that was for chewing. The saliva the uh, enzymes, the acid in your stomach. Do you know that your, the acid in your stomach, if you put it on some, some wood, it would eat the varnish away? It's acid enough to eat the food away, uh, dissolve and help uh, you know, digest the food, but not so acid to eat holes in your stomach. And uh, the uh, respiratory system, and I'll just go through this, the circulatory system, the... Uh, nervous system, and we're going to talk just a minute about the brain. The brain is a, a marvelous, a marvelous thing. Uh, you know, you know, your brain could say, raise your hand, and you raise your hand. You know, your brain could tell your feet to start walking, but what's so neat about the brain is it does things without you even telling it. You know, you don't have to say, the brain, now I want to set you on a timer, you start digesting the food tonight. No, it automatically does. There's so many things that the brain does that are just automatic responses. The human heart beats 70 times a minute. That's approximately 100,000 times a day. If you live to be 70 years old, it beats approximately 2 billion times during that 70 years. What machine invented by man has had Two billion cycles. Some of you know my father used to manufacture machines, and I remember going into, into the trust machines and seeing them at night. He would cycle those over and over and over again to see how many times they would cycle before they would break, but none of them ever reached two billion. And none of them ever grew as the body grew. Oh, what a marvelous device that we have. And I've talked about the human brain, and I will 
skip that mainly, but uh, it's been likened to a volume, a library with 25 million volumes. It's been likened to 100 supercomputers. It is amazing. And then there's the reproductive system. Isn't it marvelous that both man, if evolution was true, both man and woman would have to, had to evolve simultaneously. How would that have ever happened? And then when you think of the fact that each one of us that's in this room, we started from a, a little egg that our mother produced that was about a millionth of a gram. And it was united with a sperm from our father, which was about five billionth of a gram. That's too small to see from the naked eye. But from that little bitty beginning, God had a plan. God had a plan that little, that little combination would produce two eyes, two ears, two nostrils, 32 teeth, 206 bones, and on and on, pancreas, heart, and so forth. God had a plan. Praise God. Let's talk about man's machinery. I dare say that you in your glove compartment have a little book, which is probably called an owner's manual. I dare say that if you've got a lantern, if you've got a vacuum cleaner, whatever you would get, there is some operating instructions. One of the things that it would say is that you should use it only for the job it was intended. Don't vacuum your dog's tail with it. That's not what it was intended for. Garage door openers, whatever, they have manufacturer's instruction. Now, there's some real consequences for not following the instructions. You could have some serious personal injury. You could have some property damage. If you didn't read that that one pedal on the floor of your car is to stop it, you'd be in some serious problem. If you didn't read, and hopefully you don't do it anyways, if you didn't read that you're not supposed to smoke when you fill the uh, tank with gasoline, you could have a terrible explosion. And in addition to that, you could, in, you could, you could uh, miss out on some of the features that you have. I bought a 99 Buick about a year ago. It's a Park Avenue. It's a luxury car. I didn't realize some of the things they had. My wife the other day discovered if you press one of these buttons, it heats the seat. Pretty neat. But I didn't know that. I didn't bother to read the book. My stepfather-in-law, it was years before he knew that that little slot in there would enable him to play a tape in there. So you can miss out on a lot of enjoyment if you don't read the manufacturer's instruction. And you can ruin the product. You can really damage some things. Now, you know where I'm driving at. What book contains our manufacturer's instructions? If we're wonderfully and fearfully made then our maker is better than any machine maker. He ought to have some instructions. And thank God for the instructions. I want to tell you that you'll be blessed if you follow the instructions. You know, for example, if uh, your engine seizes up and uh, somebody says, when did you change the oil? It's got like, 80,000 miles a car. When did you change the oil? Change the oil? Never heard of it. <laughs> You'd be in real problems, wouldn't you? Okay. Likewise, if you don't follow the manufacturer's instructions, you know, you're going to have some serious consequences. There's going to be some personal injury and damage. I recommend every young man read the first eight chapters of Proverbs. By taking heed, you can avoid some real serious damage to your soul. I dare say that a lot of us are missing out on the enjoyment of His blessings because we have not read the wonderful Word of God. There are blessings by following this book.
Thank God. If you're sick, the Bible says, call for the elders of the church. Thank God for the blessing of healing. I'm hesitant to tell you this, but about three years ago, I was diagnosed with prostate cancer. But I was prayed for. (laughs) I could talk a whole long time on this. But the doctor, when I told him I'd prayed for, and when he saw the PSA go down from 6.6 to 2.63, and I told him I was prayed for, he says, you're weird. He said, I need another test. And when he did another test and it was 2.01, he said, I never want to see you again. Thank God. Thank God. Praise God. The Bible says he daily loads us with his blessings. Praise God. I was flying to Montreal the summer before last, and I looked on the plane, and there was a guy who looked familiar to me. I finally approached him. I said, do I know you? He said, I don't think so. And finally I looked at him. I said, are you Dr. Jarriott? I'd only seen him once. He says, Ganiats. I said, I'm the guy you call weird. He says, I remember you. <laughs> Thank God. Hallelujah. Are you glad for the blessings of the Lord? Oh, thank God. I'm blessed. Aren't you? Praise God. By following God's word, I didn't deserve to be healed, but thank God for his blessings. Praise God. But if you don't follow, there is eternal damnation that I really believe we need to instill in young people the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And if we don't follow his instructions, bad consequences can occur. Let me just close by a couple of thoughts. Every single thing in nature, from the subatomic particle to the entire universe, from the smallest worm, to the human body. Every single thing in nature shows design and purpose. And I believe that God has a purpose for you. Just like when that little sperm and egg united, God had a purpose for your body. When the Word of God was planted in your heart, and conception took place, and finally, maybe immediately or a time afterwards, when you were born as a new creature, God has a purpose for you. I believe that. You are not products of time and chance and accident. You have been designed. You have been wonderfully and fearfully made for a purpose. God never made any junk. You are not junk. And as I said earlier, when you wake up in the morning, if you're discouraged or you're discouraged in the afternoon or you're depressed, start thanking God. I've got two eyes. I've got two ears. I've got two nostrils. I've got two legs. I've got two arms. I've got a heart, a liver, and a pancreas. Thank God. Praise God. So God has a purpose for you. And there's a question that I believe the Apostle Paul asked, not just once. It's an important question. I I don't say it's the most important question. I think the most important question ever asked is, what must I do to be saved? But certainly very important is for you to say what the Apostle Paul Paul or Saul of Tarsus said when he was smitten down and first asked, Who art thou, Lord? And when Jesus said, I am Jesus, then he asked another question. Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? I want to tell you, young people that are here, the greatest thing you can do is find your purpose. And God has a purpose for you. The prophet Jeremiah, God had a purpose for him even before he was born. God has a plan for you. Follow his plan. Obey his word. You're wonderfully and fearfully made. God bless you. It's been good to be with you. Brother Nathaniel, I'll turn it back over to you. Praise God.
Can we stand together and just thank Jesus, Lord? I thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to be here together. Lord Jesus, I thank you, Lord Jesus, that God, all of this, Lord Jesus, will remind us, God, that we are fearfully and wonderfully made. Not just made, Lord, but we're made with a specific purpose that no one else can fulfill, that no one else can walk away from. Lord Jesus, I thank you for that, Lord. I thank you, God, for your greatness. I thank you, Lord Jesus, that you have come into this room here tonight and you have communed with us. And, Lord, that a right relationship with you was made possible when you stepped to the cross. I thank you for that. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Amen.